Um, I'm going to go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order for Thursday, June 25th. It's a special meeting for the Scarborough School Board. Can I please have tonight's attendance? Sure. Ms. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Gifchos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Snyder? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. And Mr. Bennett? Here. Okay. And if you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, opening up to public comments on the agenda. Um, if you have a public comment, you can either email us at publiccomment at scarboroughschools.org and we can read that into the record. Um, or you can raise your hand through the Zoom function. We can promote you um, and you can speak to us in the same way that you would if you were behind the podium. Erin, I promoted you at to um, panelist, and you should be able to speak. Oh, hold on. I think I've unmuted you. Uh, there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, this is Erin Rowan, Bonnie Grove Drive. Um, and I just have a brief comment tonight to say that I watched the town council meeting last night and, and participated and gave a public comment there. Um, I would like to commend um, you all for your work thus far. And I, I also appreciated Sarah's pushing back against um, the tone that was present with the council Brothers. last night. I think that that must have been hard for her to do and, and um, having been on the receiving end of that tone myself, I really appreciated her setting that example for other people in town to also say, this is, oh! this is just not okay. Um, I, like I said, I appreciate the work you've done this year. I, I do not believe what I heard last night um, in some of the counselors attempts to question your motives. Um, and so I hope that, that you also do not believe um, those kinds of questions and that you, um, as you're presenting tonight, that you remain strong and proud of the work you've done this year in spite of all of the hard things that you've had to face. Um, I, I feel better knowing that you all have tried really hard to have my children's backs. Um, so thank you. I also wanted to say that um, I might be the only person in town that's really excited to hear Monique's ESSA update. So Monique, I wanted to let you know that I'm here and I can't wait to hear it. So um, don't worry about boring everybody. I'll be here and I'll be excited. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> I'm just gonna give it another minute. Um, to see if anyone else is going to join. Denise, oh, yes. I've unmuted you. At least I think I unmuted you. Okay, I'm on my phone, so can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Um, Denise Blaine, I am a teacher at Scarborough High School. Um, I too first would like to say um, thank you for all your hard work. Um, with the budget, I have also stayed very active, so I, I appreciate everything the board has done. Um, tonight, my comment is more geared to next steps um, for opening school in the fall. Um, I am part of the START committee um, that has been doing some work over the past two weeks. Um, tonight, I would really just like to um, 
reiterate some of the things that I said in my group um, and, and make them public comment. Um, I'm finding as a teacher and as a union member, um, a little frustration in the pace at which this plan is moving along. I know we can't work at warp speed, um, but as other districts start to present their rough plans and, and we see them coming out, um, I feel myself getting more and more anxious um, about what is Scarborough going to do. Um, I, I would like to remind the board, not that I have to, but more than 60% um, of um, your staff does not live in Scarborough. Um, so as they get their notices from districts where their children are going to school, um, their anxiety levels are, are going up, not just about what are they gonna do with um, their own children, but what are they gonna do in the classroom? And I know it seems like summer just started, um, but it, it is going to come before we know it. So my pitch tonight, if there is a pitch in all of this is, um, while I appreciate the dialogue and all the talking that is, has gone into some of these meetings, um, I hope that we can get some stuff on paper and start communicating that to not just the staff, uh, but the community. So people can start planning um, for the fall. Um, so I appreciate um, April who's been in my group um, and, and it's been nice to work with her. I know that a lot of the other board members have joined the su other subcommittees and um, it's been nice to, to just let them hear what we have to say. So I, I do appreciate the dialogue. I just, um, I wanna start seeing some stuff on paper. So thank you for your time and everything that you've done. And um, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Okay. I'm just gonna wait one more second in case anyone else wants to speak. Okay, um, seeing nobody else in queue, I'm gonna go ahead and close out public comments and move us into item agenda, agenda item number 6.0, uh, goals, progress, and an ESSA update. Monique, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And it is um, good to hear that someone else in this world finds federal and state grant reporting and applications as exciting as I do. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's quite a bit of um, paperwork, but it's always wonderful when we see what those grant funds can provide to our students. So much appreciated. Uh, as you know, we are required by law um, through ESSA, through the state, uh, to connect our goals, building goals, um, to our improvement plans. It's all part of the grant process. If you recall, we had a comprehensive needs assessment several years ago and we develop goals around those and we've been tracking our progress and we have an annual timeline from which to do so. Thank you. So tonight I just wanna talk a little bit about our progress despite a global pandemic, recognize that, that progress and then share some of our thinking on next steps. Um, things are in the air this year, and um, we still have some more data to mine before identifying our focus areas and very specific goals. So I want to provide an update on our ESSA application, what funding is going to be available to us for next year as well. Just a reminder, pandemic or not, our purpose has not changed as an educational organization. It is to provide safe and inclusive learning environments, each and every student empowered to be a resilient lifelong learner, all the more important during our current uncertainties in this world. Our strategic focus areas, we have four focus areas around which we build our specific goals. The first focus area is effective teaching and learning. 
the second safe and inclusive schools, the third global citizenship, and the fourth is in and around community engagement. From those areas, we built a strategic improvement plan for this year. The focus areas that came out of that spring 2019 needs assessment were those on the list. We focused quite a bit of our energies and goals on social emotional curriculum needs. And that is another area that is emerging as we continue to move forward, as well as addressing database issues, our curriculum consistency, writing has been a focus. Um, we've made great progress in absenteeism and truancy. Uh, the area of mathematics is, continues to be an area of focus uh, and then reporting and communication um, as well. So getting right to it, our district goals focus around effective teaching and learning. We had two large goals. One was about enhancing our district-wide improvement process itself, and we've made great gains there. The second goal was really around building our staff's assessment literacy, how to use data to inform and drive instructional decisions. In our progress in this area, we implemented, as you know, a new a universal screening tool. We were able to do two diagnostic assessments, K through eight. Uh, we were able to, um, we engaged staff in two fall trainings as well as a mid-year training. Uh, we were offered um, a free pilot, um, which proved very, very helpful as we moved into an extended school closure um, of online instruction, K through eight. Uh, and that's the data that I'm continuing to work on to um, summarize and provide some data displays for our building leaders. Uh, <clears throat> we also updated our um, cognitive abilities test. We were not able to do any training because we were in extended school closure. Uh, we are going to use the, we have used at the mid-year, we looked at student growth and we identified some focus areas. One focus area, which um, is not a surprise, but it confirmed our thinking is an area of phonics. Even with our literacy implementation, that's an area we're still concerned about. So potential next steps, we want to continue to provide learning opportunities to our staff in and around data informed practices, but also we wanna revisit our annual timeline in the light of the world in which we live in now. Um, but we also may wanna consider some different district-wide goals more applicable to our current situation to address our students' needs better. K-5 worked together all four schools and they worked together under the theme of safe and inclusive schools by focusing on social emotional learning and aligned to the castle framework all staff in the, across all four schools received training in that framework what social emotional is its importance some strategies the committee has completed an assessment a needs assessment and they've identified a set of next steps uh, they endorsed Panorama as an SEL survey tool, and it was a focus within our distance learning plans. We continue to provide activities and learning opportunities for students um, <clears throat> every week through those plans, both online and offline. Uh, we also started a K-12 steering group, um, which made great strides as well. They endorsed Panorama as a survey tool. We were not able to implement that survey um, across the boards, but we are continuing to update that action plan to see if we might be able to do so moving forward. Um, so in terms of next steps, social emotional learning is a significant part of our transition planning. It's a working group of that START team. We also, in terms of next steps, want to increase our emphasis on trauma-informed practices. We want to also focus on anti-racism, which is also in the area of equity and also provide inclusion training as well as we move forward. Monique, before you move on to the next slide, could you explain what CASEL and Panorama are and for um, some listeners that may not, I don't know what those are, and then for listeners who may not know what the acronyms are, could you explain those as you go through them? Certainly, I apologize for the educational jargon. CASEL is an, a collaborative organization for academic and social emotional learning. It's a national organization and they really are a wonderful evidence-based clearinghouse 
of social and emotional research, um, resources, um, recommendations for evidence-based programs, and they also provide a wonderful um, strategic planning process by which schools can follow in order to um, implement and improve um, social emotional learning for all students in schools. Uh, SEL is social emotional learning and our start team is the um, school transition restart redesign team. <clears throat> What's Panorama? Panorama is an organization that provides um, survey tools and resources to schools um, in a variety of areas. One of their large areas is in social emotional learning. Um, they provide um, evidence-based, research-based um, survey questions and a reporting mechanism. They also provide, um, they've tapped into and have partnerships with a variety of curriculum vendors so that you can access instructional strategies based on where you are. They, another area they focus on is um, family um, and school communications um, and relationships. Uh, and then they also have another component around student success and supports for students. Thank you for the explanation. Sure. The middle school focused in this same area of safe and inclusive schools. Their focus was around a behavior framework. Um, they were looking to make that a bit more comprehensive. They did quite a bit of work and research, uh, and they developed a framework using the acronym PRIDE, P-R-I-D, Preparation, Responsibility, Integrity, Dedication, and Effort. And so what they did was they worked with students this year, and they identified encouraging practices Sometimes when students may Sorry about that. Must be my internet connection. Can you hear me now? Thank you so much. Uh, sometimes when students, particularly adolescents, don't always make good decisions, we traditionally have had a discipline framework which does teach students what not to do, but we sometimes fall short in teaching what students should do. And so that is the focus here to promote more positive behaviors and help support students in making better decisions. They have developed a plan and a flow chart uh, and they've been tracking their data. So one of the potential next steps for the middle school is to take a look at that data, review that data, and see how much continued energy they need to put into this, or they may choose to expand and move into another area around those four strategic target areas. And the high school has two building goals. Uh, the first goal was in and around their curriculum units and working on the internal curriculum guide. They identified the components of that guide they needed to work on, which would be essential questions, key themes, learning targets, and guiding principles. Um, they were well on their way. Departments worked on that collaboratively. Uh, they need to reassess and see where they are and see what kind of time they need to allocate in order to complete that process. Their second goal was also in and around, uh, was in and around safe and inclusive schools. Um, they were, took a hard look at their advisory program and wanted to identify some themes and some objectives, and they did so. Uh, there were four quarterly themes that were developed. Um, the training was provided to the staff during faculty meetings, and even during school closure, they were even able to launch at least one of those lessons virtually. So they, as well as the other schools, are going to reassess and make some adjustments for the coming year. So what does all this have to do with ESSA? Well, the ESSA funds can help fund some of these activities. Title I is focused the purpose of Title I is focused on improving academic achievement for students. Title II is really around um, professional development for all staff, teachers and leaders. Title III is uh, language instruction support for English learners and immigrant students. We do not access these funds. 21st century schools, we do not qualify for those funds. Um, Title 
excuse me, Title IV, we do qualify for those funds. Um, those are 21st century school funds, and I'll talk in detail about those. Title V is flexibility and accountability. That's a rural education initiative, and we don't qualify for Title V. So Title I, II, and IV, we receive funding. So for Title I, Title I probably has the most restrictions or constraints on the funding. We must allocate the funding for neglected or homeless students. Um, those are called set-asides. Uh, we have a requirement to engage parents and family in our Title I programming. Uh, and we have to provide equitable services for eligible private schools. The funding this past year went to Wentworth. Um, it funded additional positions in the area of literacy, specifically writing support, and in the area of social emotional learning with um, an ed technician to help support some of the behavior plans for students. For next year, uh, Wentworth will continue to receive Title I funding. We're gonna take a look at that data and see where we need to place emphasis um, in terms of providing supports for students. Um, one of the pieces during the school closure that has been a challenge is getting an accurate read on where our students are, um, whether or not they are on target or whether or not we need to provide additional supports in either literacy or math. Last year, we received $133,700. This year, our preliminary allocation, nothing is final yet, but our preliminary allocation is $131,980. So it's down a little bit. Monique, what does FRL stand for on that chart? May and reduce lunch. Um, the numbers, um, how we um, receive funny, funding, the formula, depends on the percentages of free and reduced lunch students. Thank you. Title IIA, um, we must allocate funding to support quality and effectiveness of teachers, principals, and other school staff. This is the professional development funding. Um, and also to address the learning needs of all students. So that really is the focus of the funding. So we are, our thinking this year is to focus that on providing training for teachers in support of the building goals that will align to what we need to do in terms of um, uh, our transition back to school this year. Title four is a little bit more complicated. There are um, funding allocations for three different op options. One is well-rounded education, which really provides funding for a whole slew of possibilities, everything from the arts to um, world language. Um, it's, it's, it, it's quite wide, it's quite broad, um, but also safe and healthy students uh, and effective use of technology. The technology piece is rather restrictive so we did provide money this past year around safe and healthy students. We focused that around SEL to help fund um, uh, the uh, assessments and um, activities and professional development for social emotional learning. So next year, the thinking is we will continue to do so given where we are with our pandemic uh, and the impact that has had on students and families and staff. Last year, we received um, $13,000 in Title IV. This year, um, about the same $13,600. Sorry, I failed to mention Title IIA. Title IIA last year was 70, approximately $70,000. This year, it's $81,000. And finally, overall, um, we're down a little bit in our title funds, but it's still um, an amount of money that is over $200,000 that we want to allocate towards um, this current year in supporting our students and our staff. Um, this presentation is part of our um, requirement to ask for public input. And if the public would like to get involved or be part of a process, um, especially in terms of looking at the data, please reach out to me 
especially if you have some ideas on how you want to see some of this funding allocated. Um, we have a deadline of August 1st to submit the report for this year, as well as the application for next year. So I will certainly keep the board appraised of what our goals will be. You'll certainly hear us roll out our goals in the fall, um, and we'll have a better sense at that point in time um, how we're using, very specifically, how we're using this funding moving forward. Does the board have any questions of me? Hillary? Um, I have some, so I know that Title I funding is allocated based on the free and reduced lunch percentage. How are Title II and Title IV funding, um, how are those allocated? Uh, it is based in part on free and reduced lunch numbers, but also our enrollments over time. Uh, and uh, we receive those in Title, I believe Title IV, Title IV has a cutoff number um, as well. Uh, and Title II is, is in part enrollment and part free and reduced lunch. So, so I guess I'm curious specifically about um, anti-racism curriculum, and um, I had requested to do a, a, a separate um, workshop on this because I know that it's not um, to the level that I personally would prefer, um, but it does seem like Title IV might give us an opportunity to fund some of, um, some of that. Is that accurate? Yes. And is, has that been allocated for that purpose? Uh, not as of yet. I need to work with the Leadership Council. We're going to take a look at our data. We, the SEL group also has an action plan as well. And my understanding is that will be embedded within their action plan. OK. And then it, do, and it, then it seemed also to me that Title II might be relevant in terms of professional development for distance learning that we may not otherwise be able to afford. Is that also in the plan? Absolutely. Thank you. Max? Um, just to piggyback off of what Mrs. Durgan said about the anti-racism curriculum, I think that that should definitely be a focus when going forward just because of today's like the, um, I guess, waking up to systemic racism in our society. I mean, Scarborough is such a white town that it cannot be ignored. I see racism daily in our school. So I think that um, a focus on anti-racism curriculum and better education for like black culture and that kind of thing should be focused on. Absolutely. We, um, with the um, social studies curriculum recently being revised, um, we will, um, that area, we had, that has been a bit delayed um, because of um, constraints within our budgets over the years. Um, but the t we need to act on that sooner rather than later. It's more than a, um, an issue of just implementing a new curriculum. There is significant training. Um, that needs to happen for staff as well as um, leaders around um, exploring our own implicit biases and taking a look and starting the conversation around that. It, um, we want to be sure that our staff know how to have these difficult conversations and there are um, lots of curriculum options, but a big part of that will need to be um, looking at our um, our own biases and looking at our policies and practices across the boards as an organization as well. So I'll just say, just again quickly, because I, I agree with Max, the time is now and I don't want us to say, um, sorry, we, we can't implement an anti-racist curriculum because we don't have the money for it, even though I know that we don't have a lot of money right now. So I just want to make sure that, um, that that is, you know, and all those things that you said, I. I I understand, Monique, but I just want to make sure that that's being started now as opposed to um, later or or being put on the back burner for when when or if there's money available. Understood. Any other comments? Monique, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Excellent. All right. Moving into new business, 7.1, um, it is 
regarding the 2019-2022 professional staff contract. Hillary, turning it over to you. Sorry. Um, yep, so I just wanted to give a quick update on the professional staff contract, the faculty contract, also known as the teacher's contract. Um, it was signed on thir Thursday. Last it was signed last week um, and it was posted on our website with literally within an hour of signing. Um, so it is now available on our website and has been since almost the moment it was signed. Um, and then um, so if anyone has any questions about that, I also have another quick update about um, about some other negotiations, but I'll pause there. OK, um, Max, you still have your hand up, but I assume that was from earlier. Well, I shouldn't assume that, but OK. Um, OK, so then my second update um, just regarding it's it's tangentially. Well, it, it is related to the contracts um, is that um, in um, response to the um, resolution that the town council um, passed a, a, at the beginning of June, um, the board negotiations team has met with the um, ESP, which is the educational support professionals group. Um, ed techs mostly is mostly represents ed techs and secretaries in that group. Um, we have met with them regarding COLA concessions. We have also met with the teachers negotiating group regarding COLA concessions. Um, we have a meeting on Friday with the administrators um, on that same topic. And we have um, emails out to schedule meetings with um, the bus drivers and the food service and custodians um, bargaining units, uh, which are all represented. Those two are represented by the SEA and the um, administrators and the maintenance workers are self-represented. Um, so we do have um, some irons in the fire there. Um, I don't have any specifics that I can share with you, but I just wanted to make sure that um, that it was out there that um, that is something that we have been meeting about. Thank you. Pause for one hot second for any questions. Okay. Seeing none, moving into 7.2 FY21 budget. Sarah? Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll just talk through, I think, how this is going to go. And But Kate is actually going to, I think, she has offered to share her screen and take us through updates. So after the town council meeting last night, um, we have to make some revisions to our budget. Um, what we spoke to Kate today about and Sandy and Diane was, um, rather than going through specific line items, if we could just kind of do like the um, the voting categories in the group. So we have a legal obligation to put everything in certain voter categories that will go out to the public in order for the referendum. So we need to accomplish that task. Um, but we also have some outstanding, um, some items in motion that Hillary just referred to. And so we're not at a stage where we can um, commit to any reductions in our budget from those contracts. And so I think the best bet at this point is to just do sort of the legal portion that we need to do. Um, and then hopefully circle back around and go through the line items detail at a different date. Um, once we get through all of that, I do think that the public is looking for us to give our endorsement either a yes or a no for the budget. So I would like to spend some time um, just everyone talking through their perspective on that. Kate, anything to add or Sandy? Um, I'll just say that uh, I, I hope everybody can see the screen that I'm sharing. This is a, a two page document that's basically designed to guide us through where um, the, the process from the school board second reading last week to where we are today and, and the um, adjustments that, that need to be made tonight. Thanks, Kate. Is everyone okay with that approach? Any? I guess, can I ask a question about what's on the screen now, Kate? Mm -hmm. So this is just our second reading versus last year's budget. Am I correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, what I'll I'll scroll down for a minute just so people can see what's on these two pages. 
um, you've got the budget as it was approved by the board. And you're right, the, the differences here are from last year to this year. Um, this is the school board's second reading, um, all the operating budgets plus capital. Um, the bottom of the sheet is um, the allocations that were approved last night by the town council for those same segments of the school budget. And then down on the second page, there are some adjustments um, that we're recommending be made tonight to get us to that reduction that the town council made last night. And at the very bottom, we have the adjusted budget, which matches uh, what the town council approved for the schools. Thanks, Kate. So, Sarah, do you want to um, talk us through this? Do you want me to, to jump in a little bit or what's what's good for everybody? Yeah, I think you just want to talk us through like where the additional reductions came from, um, from our second reading to uh, including the town council's vote last night to get to where we are right now. Okay. So, right, so the difference between these two blocks, uh, what the school board has approved so far and what the town council has allowed the school budget to include, um, the differences are a total of 242,180 reduction to our general fund operating budget and then a $406,900 reduction to the capital budget. And uh, so today the, the school leadership team sat together for a bit and um, talked through some of the things that we've already seen, some of the things that, that this group has discussed many times in public um, and uh, essentially accomplished two things. One was to book some insurance premium reductions. Um, you'll see some ups and downs there in this first section, but a net reduction of just under $20,000. And that's just because uh, an item in motion, we received our final numbers on Friday um, after the, the board had already voted. So that's a reduction we could take quickly and easily. The other reductions in the general fund operating budget uh, down in this section, we have simply allocated proportionately to the largest, the three largest cost centers in the school budget. Um, again, Sarah said this, the board needs to place those reductions into the voter category so that there can be a notice posted for voters um, for the referendum. And uh, that has to be up pretty much immediately after you folks take a vote. So um, we haven't done specific line item reductions yet, but we've proportionately reduced each of those cost center categories uh, by the amount shown here to reach the 242,180. So comments, questions, thoughts about that, maybe before I do CIT. Can I, I'll put my hand up. No, Leanne, you're on mute. Yeah, that would explain why. I was like, Hillary, you're all set. Um, <laughs> sorry. Why isn't Hillary talking? She's always talking. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. And she's being really quiet, so you don't know what's going on, right? <laughs> so I think I, I have less of a question and more of a clarification, because I think this is what you said, Kate. So after some of the um, confirmed insurance numbers, so the, sorry, so the difference between our operating, our general fund operating budget of what we asked for and what they gave us was $242,000. You removed some additional savings that we got from insurance that we just have a clearer picture on what that amount actually is. And then did you just distribute the rest into those three categories by that's, percentage on how large those three categories are? Exactly. With a little okay. bit of rounding, that's basically what okay. we did. The three largest categories. And the, there is a, a certain amount of strategy behind that, Hillary, which is that under the law, 
um, we are not able to take out more than 5% of any category. So if we, if we try to do um, reductions without specific goals in the small categories, we run the risk of you know, having a shortfall in, in funding in those categories. So we, we wanna go with the biggest, the three biggest categories and you're right, it's simply a proportional reduction. Okay, and then also just another clarifying question. I, I, I think I recall that funds can be moved if when when and if you ask if if the board approves that is that the case um yeah from category to category they can be um the caveat is that once the voters have voted they're voting actually on the placement of those monies into those categories so yeah. you cannot we, you cannot remove more than 5% of any category and put it in another one. And the, the thought process is, you know, if, if I said I wanted you to have uh, money in guidance, I don't want you to take all the money out of guidance and put it into um, transportation. Yeah, yeah. So there, okay. there are limits, but because these are the, the, the largest three categories, they have the most flexibility in terms of the amounts of money that can be shifted. Thank you. You're welcome. Alicia? Thank you. So, Kate, can you go back to the first page? Is this what is this what the voters are going to be voting on? Uh, no, the voters are going to be voting on the amended one. The voters vote on what the town council gives us. So oh, I didn't word that well. There, there are eleven categories, right? That they vote on. Right. right. Are those the eleven categories right there? Um. No, the 11 categories aren't represented on this page. Um, I can pull something up that will show them to you. Yeah, Let's thank see. you. I don't actually have the, the, the voter notice yet. I'm still working on that, waiting on you guys to have a vote, but let me unshare for a minute here. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Thank you. I mean, I voted on it plenty of times. You think I'm... <laughs> What was that I voted on? <laughs> what was that thing? You'll you'll recognize when I when I put this up here. Uh, if I can get my screen to open, what I'm talking about. Maybe four. Come on, baby. Okay, so um, this is the voter categories, and actually the. Um, I'm not sure why this isn't letting scroll. There we go. The, the 11 categories are these ones way over on the far left, regular instruction, and then that has some subcategories, special education, CTE, and so on. Um, so these numbers that are sorted into these categories are the ones that the voters will see. Okay. So the, the summary that I was just showing you was basically the whole general fund operating budget, which is included in this number. This is the number you folks voted on last week and I don't have a new one for tonight yet. And you said to Hillary, answer Hillary's question that the uh, distribute, uh, distribution of or, or allocation of the reduction is based on the biggest cost centers of the... Of right, the yeah, just at, at a quick glance here, you can see that um, regular instruction is 22 million which is obviously the hugest one. Special education is 10 million. And then um, the student and staff support comprises all of this, um, these five different subcategories. And that adds up to, oh, let's see, uh, 5.2 million. So those are the top three. Is there a way you can share this document with us to look at while you're talking so I can just my head around it a little bit? Um, well, this one is actually one of the documents you already have. This is one of the backup documents from the second reading. Um, it was a massive PDF and it's um, part of the, it is the supporting documents for our last meeting. Okay, then I can pull that up. Yeah, I think if you can't find it, let me know when I can send it out again. Is it but, in email or shared drive or both? Um, it would have been an email from Kelly, I think, and Kelly posted it on online. So you could just go right out to the website and find it publicly. I think I, 
printed all those out for you. But thank you. <laughs> Look in your stack of paper, right? I do have. Let me know if you can't find it because we can we can send it again for sure. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go back to this little working doc thing here. So yeah, these are these are not the voter categories. This is just all of general fund together school nutrition, adult education, and then the non-tax revenues for each of those. April? Hey, this is a pretty nitty gritty question, but can you um, try and explain what ended up happening with the middle school laptop tech refresh and yeah, where those funds are now? Absolutely, yeah, and I, I didn't actually get down to the second section of this page, which is the CIP. Oh, page. sorry. So let's do that because, you know, okay. thank you for the intro. Um, so in the capital budget, the budget reduction we needed to hit was $406,900, and there was this little shift back and forth of whether the 150,000 for middle school tech refresh was gonna be an operating or maybe it was gonna be bonded and then it went back to, uh, sorry, appropriated, not operating. Um, and then there was discussion about it should be an operating. So there was a lot of talk about that $150,000. Um, so what ultimately happened last night with town council was that they made a reduction of $50,000 to our capital budget over and above what they had already had in their um, in their proposal from the town council finance committee. And I, I, I was understanding that the, the rationale was that they felt that that tech refresh money should either not be there or should be accounted for someplace else or um, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but it was the conversation was around the middle school tech profession. Did we really need those funds? So uh, today, my friend Don Bajan finished a very um, impressive looking seven year plan for our tech refreshes, which is something he's been working on for quite a while um, to kind of smooth out um, the numbers around tech refresh, you'll remember we have a cyclical refresh every year, it's a different phase. So what happens is on, in, in the fourth year or fourth um, phase, it's the high school and the high school is so much bigger and more complex than the other schools that you end up having sort of steady, 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 and then a bomb. You've got a whole nother grade there. Um, you know, you've, you've got more complex needs at the high school and more kids and more teachers. So Don's goal was to sort of smooth things out so that each year we wouldn't, um, we would be able to manage refreshes so that each level had um, the appropriate technology, whether th that there wasn't a bump. Um, he was striving for something in the $350,000, $400,000 range for each year. So in doing that, um, he figured out a timetable whereby for middle school, we can take FY21 money and we can purchase the student laptops and we can defer the $50,000 that's been cut to FY22 to buy the teacher laptops. Um, and it will still be on the right cycle because it will be sort of June and July. Um, and uh, he assures me that, that we can make this work and I trust him implicitly about that. Um, does, I, does that mean that we have to buy the laptops by like Tuesday? No, no. This is for next year and the year after. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm okay. Thanks. Yeah. I don't know what year it is either, Helene. Um, so yeah. So we're, right now we have a hundred thousand dollars in our operating budget, which isn't even depicted on this page. That's been there all along, and we have fifty thousand dollars. Excuse me. We have another hundred thousand dollars in CIP but that's been reduced by 50,000. And that 50,000, um, Don and I will both be reminding everybody when we get around to the FY22 budget, hey guys, there's that 50 again, and you know, here's what we're gonna do with it. So that was, that was the solution to that. And then the other items that you see on this capital improvements reduction list are the things that we've already talked about. 
um, if we take out $31,900, we're deferring all of the um, masonry repair money that we put into CIP. And um, with the $50,000 reduction, we're deferring the capital monies for the playground upgrades. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then this third one is dear and nearer to our hearts, um, $275,000, which we added in to attempt to move forward the long range planning on the K-2 schools. Uh, but I did hear Sarah say last night that that was something that we would push off prior to trying to make reductions in other areas. Um, I'll go back to these two facilities projects here and say that uh, we did talk to our friend Todd today and he is aware of um, these reductions and willing to work within them. We, we did spend a lot of time talking about the playground um, with Todd and with Allison because there is an equity issue for some of our folks who aren't able to get to uh, some of the playground equipment. And we have made a commitment, um, which I've noted in sort of shorthand here that we will get started on some of the easy um, fixes in terms of a walkway and, a, and an area that Todd wants to rework um, on the Wentworth playground. And we're gonna make that happen with, with operating funds. Um, but we won't be able to have quite the uh, scope in that first year that we wanted to have um, in getting that off the ground. Um, we were down to, at this point, we were down to $50,000, which wasn't necessarily um, the scope of a capital project anymore. You know, as, if you start to think about it that way, uh, it was something that we, we can probably piece together from our operating budget. And we're definitely committed to being able to help our uh, students at Wentworth gain access to some more playground equipment. Um, the, the equipment itself is quite expensive, but we can definitely do some work in terms of the grounds. Um, I think you heard Todd talking about like converting wood chips to one of those rubberized walkway surfaces or play surfaces where a wheelchair can roll over easily and a staff member can push a child if need be um, without having to um, navigate that rocky terrain of, of the wood chips. And um, we've also heard a lot of comments about people um, wanting to fundraise for the playgrounds. And I think that's a great idea as well. We've talked a lot about alternative uh, funding sources and people wanting to give back in the community. And that's kind of a neat idea as well. So um, that's what's, what that is about. Um, and I guess questions about those bits. Alicia? So I've got a um, couple of questions and um, maybe comments. Uh, the, what do we need to vote on for CIP? I mean, is for it- For CIP, just you need to make a reduction of $406,900 because the town council has given us that much less than what you voted on in second reading. So we don't need to decide what projects we're gonna decrease the funding for. Well, actually with capital you do because they're project specific. So, I mean, we had talked about the ADA playground um, and um, that's something that I feel strongly about. And, and I hear you saying that we can get a little bit done. And, and, you know, I discussed the fundraising issue, I think at last finance committee meeting that Kenny Funk had done that and it was great, but um, to me, it feels really uncomfortable to say that we're gonna fund other capital projects and we're going to try to um, fundraise for equitable access to our playground. That, that feels just really bad to me. And- um, That's um, uh, absolutely agreed. I think it's, it's an awful choice to be making and no one here wants to make it. I think the problem is that in the appropriated capital budget, there really isn't anything else left to take. I, I just, I guess I would like us to all um, as a board take, you know, understand that this is the leadership's recommendation, but take a look at the capital budget um, ourselves tonight, like we would in the finance committee. And, and that my ask would be that we just take our own look at that to see if there's anything else that we can do to try to save that money. I mean, 
that was a reduction anyways. And to shift it again, I, I just, I don't feel like I'm doing my job if I just say, okay, let's stop there. I, I really would like to take another look and see if there's anything else that we can do if others are, are amenable to it. So I'll just speak just to, to the, clarify, though, I, to the, to the rules yeah, of it. I mean, um, so the capital budget's a little bit different, right? Because we, the community doesn't vote on that. Only the town council does. Um, but the, the way that the capital budget is set up, you're uh, raising the money for specific projects. So you're right, Alicia, you could say, I, you know, I don't want this money for this, I want it for something else. Um, and we don't have to say that for the voters tomorrow, but we would have to say it for the community you know, fairly soon. And I, I think I said in an email, I don't know what the legal requirement is for us to have our revised detailed budget out, um, but I'm sure our community is gonna be interested in knowing what we're doing and what we're not doing. So yeah, absolutely. Well then I guess, um, do we wanna, I mean, I would I would ask the group to at least defer that decision tonight. And um, I don't know if you want to kick that back to finance for saving time or if the whole group has an interest in diving in and looking at it. But I, I would like to do that. I mean, whether it's tonight or at finance. So the, the vote that you have I would, tonight has to allocate funds um, by, in CIP, it's by technology, transportation, and facilities. And facilities is obviously the biggest category and has the most money in it. Um, so that's, I think those would be the areas you'd be working with. You could still reduce $50,000 in facilities and then look for something else in facilities to shift. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Right. I guess I would, I would oh, just- Sorry, Sarah. No, I, I just to answer Alicia's question, I would just say let's let's just pull it up pull up the appropriated line items now and go through that and see if there's a place that we can agree because I would rather just get it done now than have to circle back if people want to know yeah. what our budget is and I'm this happy has been going that. on for a while so thank you if everyone's okay with it I, was, I don't uh, think it'll take that long there's there's I mean, not I, a whole lot of left to I guess to I cut. want to see that it's a priority for everybody else too I mean I don't want to be speaking out of turn but it it it's always been a priority for me. So it's my request. And I, I mean, I honor obviously what the majority thinks. So. Kate, are you happy to pull that up? I am. I'm just having a little trouble okay. finding it. I got too much stuff open here. So bear with me a second. I'll find it. I have two questions, but one of them is related to this, and I don't know if it will. I I have the same issues as Alicia does. Like I I I find it hard to believe that that our playgrounds aren't accessible playgrounds. And I guess my question is, we're starting this work now, like why isn't this a big project to make all of our playgrounds fully accessible and and why isn't it bonded um well i can't answer why it's not bonded because that's a town decision and there are some very mystifying choices in that uh, area this year to me uh, i can't answer that actually the the playground surfaces that we have now are considered to be ada approved um, the, the wood chips that we use are supposed to be navigable, um, but from a practical standpoint, we're really finding that that's not the case. I mean, they're, they're, they're marketed and sort of um, authorized as uh, um, a good surface for playgrounds and accessible for kids. But in practice, what happens is that the, the wood chips kind of, as Todd described it, they kind of push up and they get into lumps and clumps and and bumps. Yeah, they're and, super uneven, and I, right. I can't and understand so if how you, they they would be easy, easily navigable. Exactly. So we're discovering that you know, although you know the label says ADA accessible, the reality is not is not panning out. So that's why it hasn't been an issue immediately. Um, I would say Allison could probably speak to um, the changing needs of our students, but I've observed that we. Um, you know, have kids with um, a number of, of physical 
needs more so at Wentworth School this year in Eight Corners, um, which is where we were planning to start the project. So um, I pulled up the document. This is uh, an amended version of what we had before us last week at second reading. It's kind of hard to see, I'm afraid, but this section right here, if I can get it to move, is everything that's appropriated in facilities. I'm trying to queue it up so we can see everything. So right. can I just ask one more thing? Yep. How do you like, is there any way to go back and, or, or maybe it's too late for this, but I guess I can't understand why a playground wouldn't be bonded. I mean, it's a permanent structure. I mean, can you like appeal that? Um, I tried appealing a number of things like middle school <laughs> laptops and, and that didn't work. Um, and I, I, you know, of course I could appeal anything, but I think we're at, we're at the end of the game here. I don't mean you specifically. I just mean like us, like that just seems, it seems, I can't imagine. Uh, okay, so I think probably part of the problem is I can't that, imagine a lot of things, but a lot of things happen. So. I think probably part of the problem is that it's a $50,000 ask and it's not a like a, a building. It's, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I guess I, I'm not even gonna defend the decision because I don't understand it. What um, would the ask be if we fully funded it? We started with 100,000. And so that, that, would, was, that was supposed to be the beginning of a staged replacement at Eight Corners and, um, and Wentworth School. But what would it be if we did this to all the playgrounds and made them all ADA accessible and appropriate and had appropriate services? I don't know. I know that the $100,000 was just a start for two buildings. I know, but I mean, just to Alicia's point, like it just, it feels gross to not have that available and accessible for all of our students. And it also feels, uh, yeah. It, and, it, and then to, to have them say, well, that's appropriated and not bonded, even though it's all part of a permanent structure. I just also find that kind of gross. I, I think, Sarah, didn't I ask to, for that to be put on the list for requested for bonded? When we when we did the follow up after our finance meeting, because it was a permanent structure and we had we back and forth about that, do you know where that landed? I mean, I don't remember, recall them talking about it specifically, but uh, I think the way it works is the bond committee makes who I don't even know who they are uh, makes the recommendation and the finance committee has the final authority. So when we asked to move the tech refresh back to be to be bonded, the finance committee was their decision to move it to appropriate it. So ultimately it's the, it's the town finance committee's decision. Uh, but I don't recall them having a specific conversation about the playground. I don't either. Like no. the tech refresh, I, 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 I could see the reason why it would be bonded, but, I, but, and it has been in the past, but I mean, technically this is even more appropriate to be bonded in my opinion. I mean, it's not like we take our playgrounds down at the end of the year and put them back up. Yeah, so I, I think it's frustrating, right? And I don't think it's right, but I, I don't know. It feels like we're out of options. Uh, I don't know that there's anything we can do at this point. Um, and, and so if we feel strongly that it needs to be in there, at least even at the significantly reduced amount, we just need to agree on where we're going to cut the $50,000 from to fund it. Uh, I'm afraid I have to agree with Sarah because your council is not going to go back and make changes for you after their meeting last night um, until the referendum. They're they're done with us. They're not going to do anything for us. That was pretty clear. Um, so at the moment, what you're looking at here is everything that's left in facilities and appropriated, and that is the furnishings for the modular, $100,000 for long range planning, which we all know what that is and $75,000 to replace underground pipes at the middle school. And uh, there's a hole in the ground right now. They've done half the project with the money we saved from this year. 
And so we pretty much have to finish putting the pipes in and, and close the hole or we won't have HVAC at, at middle school. So that was the one that Todd said, please don't take that one. So does it have to come out of facilities because that was the way it was appropriated from town council or is it only once it's sent to voters as a facilities? Um, it won't go to the voters, it's the town council town and they've, council. Seen it, they've seen it as a facilities project. Um, the fact is that there really isn't anything anyplace else either. Um, uh, John's got the classroom laptops for the new classrooms. He's got our teacher uh, devices for the new staff. He's got network switches, which he's already reduced. And we've got um, the tech refresh, which we all know what that's about. Um, and then we have the passenger van for transportation, which we've, we've also talked about and made a priority. So we're, you know, we're in that place where there are no good choices right now. Can you go down to facilities? This is all bonded. Those are bonded, okay. Yeah. And again, I mean, I, I, I have lots of questions about why um, Peter's favorite subject of painting hallways is a bonded item where the playgrounds aren't a bonded item. Um, but I, you know, I asked the question several times during the process and I didn't really get very far. So I think it's, I know that the, the town finance office consults with what they call a bond council, which is an attorney, attorney's office that helps them decide what's suitable for the bond market and what isn't. So I'm not saying that they're doing this stuff arbitrarily. Um, there, there are obviously parameters um, in terms of, you know, the type of work that it is that you can sell a municipal bond for. So I just put a proposal out there on the table. Um, I, I, well, I think I'm just trying to think of this two ways. One is, can we, if we really don't think we can do anything with $100,000 in long range planning, then we just, then we're basically just keeping that in there to build that fund for when we can do something, but that may be an area to potentially pull from. The other idea is leave it as is, acknowledge that it's not what we want, and then make a push for next year to do what Hillary suggests, which is to fully fund ADA compliant playgrounds at all of our schools and make that a big um, sort of bonding item. I think, so to me, if, if, if beginning this project, so that's not fully funded, but just to start it was originally asked that had an original ask of $100,000. I can't, 30,000 seems so insignificant compared to that, that I would almost rather say to Todd, what Sarah just said, like, what do you need to get this done fully? Not $100,000, not $30,000, like, how do we get this done in, in one fell swoop and make sure that everything is accessible and and ask for that and and advocate for that to be bonded because it is a playground and it is a permanent structure and i'm i feel like that might be more benefit like it might happen sooner if we did that than it would if we did 30,000 this year and then, okay, well now maybe we can ask for the 100,000. Okay, and then maybe the next year, I mean, that, that feels like there's a, if there's a possibility that we could get the entire project done in FY22, I feel like that's a better choice than getting an eighth of it done in FY21, another third in FY22, a quarter in FY, you know. I, I like that idea, Hillary, but I, I, I worry that Today, there are kids who, who don't have accessibility. And I also worry that it's gonna be rejected and we won't find that out for, for quite some time. And so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this now that she's pulled it up and remembered, I mean, we had this discussion in, in finance, that, but it's, you know, there's not, there aren't any good options here, right? I mean, it's, it looks like it comes down to right. long range planning or, or partially funding the, the the playground and both but of I those. feel like 
harsh and there are kids who might not have access today but we're only fixing some of the access at only one school right. with thirty thousand dollars whereas I feel like if we advocated really hard next year, we could fix all of the access at all of the schools for all of the kids. But but that doesn't um, mean that we shouldn't commit today to do what we can for it and and resolve that we'll continue that work in the future. I, I would say a couple of things about that. One is that um, Todd and Allison have both sworn um, on their firstborn children that we are going to move forward with something to help the kids at Wentworth School next year, um, because that's uh, you know that's an ethical must. We need we need to get that moving, and whatever we can do, we will do. I would say. Actually, can I just pause? And are you talking about without that thirty thousand dollars, or with that thirty thousand dollars? I'm talking about in our operating budget. We will defer other money and and. Okay. You know, so without not, the thirty thousand, not do something without that money. Um, obviously, it won't be as much as what we could do with the with the money that we asked for in the first place. The other thing that I would say is that I love the idea of having a comprehensive plan for all the playgrounds. And I did want to throw out that when when Todd and I were first discussing this with the other school leaders, we did envision it as a two year phased program for a couple of reasons. One is that Todd can't be at all the playgrounds. Um, for the two months of the summer when we would have access to them, maybe, um, and get it all done in one year. Um, but secondly, because what we were hoping to do was to do some of the ground and site work first in terms of just, you know, sidewalks and, and covered spaces and, and the, the physical space, and then um, engage a team of experts to talk to us about adaptive playground equipment because what we don't know is what's the appropriate play um, equipment for a student who has a disability, what's going to engage that student um, in some fun play out on that playground. Um, and so we've already been talking with some of the occupational therapists, for example, and you know, some of the folks in special services about, well, what, it, what kind of cool things could we get? Um, but we had envisioned it as a couple of years project um, from the beginning, just because it's got a big scope to it. Uh, but I definitely like the idea of a more um, comprehensive plan taking into account all the schools and all the playgrounds and all the kids. I think that's a great, great way to approach it. Well, Hillary, if we do that, what, can we make a resolution tonight that we will we'll form this committee or something immediately to start looking at the scope to see if there if there's anybody that would be willing to look at um, fundraising or or commitments from businesses and then also the the bonding piece like how big the scope would be and bringing in some some of our special services experts can, yeah can I'll vol I mean I would volunteer for it it's really important to me or and I don't know if it's separate or if it's part of long-range planning but either way I'm happy to do the work that's kind of a neat idea, yeah, because Todd and Allison have already been um, sort of deep in the in the details of, of what we can and can't do and, and how quickly. And so it, it would kind of be a natural for long range planning, I guess, huh, Hillary? Maybe um, something we could take up. I feel Maybe really bad. I, I feel a lot better with, with that reduction if we could commit as a group that that committee would be forming like immediately to start that work. I would agree, Alicia. I think that um, it's a necessity. I do think it probably belongs under long range planning. Um, and it may require a subcommittee um, from the team, but we need to address this. This is this this is not okay. Nick, you've had your hand up. Yes. Um, so we've kind of danced around this a little bit, and I just wanted to kind of say this out loud from a long range planning perspective. We're also on this same page talking about planning for a brand new school. And so while I'm usually a huge fan of big comprehensive projects, I guess I'm feeling like the one playground we have that's going to be here in the long run is Wentworth. And that's where this work was going to start. And so part of me is like, why would we ask students to go without for a whole year while we come up with a comprehensive plan to renovate all of our playgrounds and three of them will go offline. 
probably a few years after the work is completed. So I'm just kind of thinking, I don't know, I'm just trying to think from a, from a efficiency standpoint, like what makes the most sense. I don't want to ask students of a certain phase to wait so that we can have a bigger conversation about all of our playgrounds. I, I feel like if there's $50,000 we can put toward getting some stuff out there for those Wentworth kids this year, then that's something that's, that's worth, worth doing. And kind of comes back to what I said at the last meeting, which is I tend to be, I'm much more in favor of maintaining what we have, these ground maintenance lines of the 50,000 and the 31.9, than leaving $100,000 in long range planning for our K2 project if that project is not something that we know we can start right now. I don't know. I don't want to leave the money there just to hope that it builds over time. You know what I mean? But I may be in the minority here. I, just to address the long range planning money, I, I do want to leave it there. I think that um, if there is something that we can get done with the $100,000, then great. But I think um, either way, we need to start saving for that because we're just, I mean, we know, we, we know, we know we need it. And and the longer we take to get started, the more money we're going to spend, the longer kids are going to be in insufficient um, facilities. I mean, I see your point, Nick, but I can, Kate, can you clarify? Like, I thought that some of this was for eight corners work. Sorry, it looks like I got frozen. I look very, uh, you I look, look like pensive. I, I look <laughs> like I saw something out the window. So I'm going to stop asked, my video. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, gotta love it. See, now I thought that was an at home thing, but I'm in my office and it let me out too. Um, so originally, Hillary, if you look at the, um, where my cursor is here, the grounds and site maintenance for playground was originally going to be half, um, for eight corners and half for Wentworth, because those are the two buildings where, um, we have the largest population of students using wheelchairs, plus the most challenges on the playground. So, yeah. um, so that was the idea that we were going to tackle both of those in terms of at least the site development piece. Um, and when I say that, I mean like, you know, the, the surfaces, the, the walkways and, and um, the surfaces underneath the play equipment. Um, so then when we reduced it in that first go round to 50,000, the conversation was about, well, let's start with Wentworth because, um, and to Nick's point, that's the building that's going to be with us the longest. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a place where we can sort of uh, take an already new and shiny and great playground and, and just make it um, available to more children. Kate? Yep. Um, Allison has come into the oh, meeting, awesome. and I'm hoping that um, maybe she can speak to this a little bit more as well. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hey, Allison. Can hear you. Hi. So I think Kate's done a great job speaking to it. I will say uh, at K2, when uh, students are, um, have accessibility issues, we tend to redistrict them to the Eight Corners School. So the biggest impact is for our eight corners in Wentworth School. And though we are meeting ADA compliance technically, we are um, under servicing their access compared to their peers. Um, and Todd and I, when we realized we needed to prioritize, which, uh, you know, due to the budget, we did um, prioritize Wentworth School, because we do, as Kate said, we do have the wood chips down, but it has become increasingly over time difficult for the wheelchairs to access the um, adaptable swings that we put in. Um, ideally, we'd like to create another area that had adaptable equipment for anyone to access, but again, under budget time. So that's why we prioritize Wentworth. Eight Corners, um, there was a, a grant years ago to build in accessible equipment. So there are pieces there, but it is um, not at the level that meets the needs of our students at this point. So happy to answer any questions. I think Kate's done a great job. 
So just to be clear, Kate, um, if we remove this from long range planning, Kate seemed to think that you and Todd had a plan to make sure that there was something in place. Uh, and then we're also talking about maybe under long range planning, coming up with a more longer range and more comprehensive plan on what to do and, and how to fund this for the for the following year. Well, right. so, so to speak to that just a little bit, I'm uh, Todd and, and I have have often faced the removal of something from our budget over the years. Um, it's not uh, it's not an unusual thing to happen. And so our default mode is to say, well, what do we absolutely have to get done, and what can we um, defer or rework or reallocate from our operating budget to make sure that that has to get done. So that was the type of conversation that we had. Um, and Allison was in a conversation with us earlier today as well. I, I will also add uh, specifically, Hillary, to your question that um, Kate Todd and I thought that we might benefit from some um, community re free resources and we could meet the minimum uh, initial uh, requirement at Wentworth, hopefully for about $30,000 for this coming year. Hey, Allison, how did you get that grant last time? Um, you know, that's a great question. I'd have to go back and talk with Ann Lovejoy about that. Um, I, th I think it was a parent piece and it was limited, maybe about $5,000, but we had someone come in and uh, consult with us about what pieces would be uh, good to begin with. So we could definitely revisit those type of initiatives as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Kristen? When we talk about the playground pieces, the actual equipment, those can be moved building to building, correct? Do we know that? I think that's true of Probably some Probably not as easy as it sounds. Okay. I, I think it's true of some pieces, Kristen, and it would depend on what it was made of and how it was constructed, whether it was like, you know, take apart or pick it up and move. Um, we've had a bunch of different types of structures, so some yes and some no. Yeah, I mean, I'm not thinking like move them for no reason, but when eight corners, should the day come that it does close, can that equipment go along to the new building? Okay. You mean if we had bought new things, adaptive equipment? Yes. Yeah, and I think it, it also depends on the type of material that things are made out of. I know we had some really cool uh, things at eight corners that were made of wood and over time they disintegrated. So, um, you know, there, there's a question in terms of the durability and, and longevity of these things as well. Yeah. So I think we just need to, oh, sorry, it was Nick in line. Go ahead, Nick. Nick, did you have a comment? Sorry, I think I left my hand up. Okay. Yeah, so I think we just we need to make a call, right? So it's, it's either $50,000 for this um, or $50,000 that we take from long range planning or uh, potentially $30,000 to, to the point that Allison just made. Um, I don't know, Leanne, if you want to do that in the form of, if we should do that in the form of a motion or how you guys want to handle this procedurally. Um, I think we would need to do it in the form of a motion. So motion to move $30,000 from long range planning into uh, ground and site maintenance for the playground. Second. So I have a question. So is that the, is that the, the reduction that was recommended. Can Kate, can you go back to the 
to the original sheet so that had the reductions on it? The, the original proposal was for, I believe, 100000 and it just went away. And then it was $50,000, and that was $50,000 was just for Wentworth. No, yeah, I know that. But what was the original, like this? This is what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah it's 50000 But I think Allison just said that they could make some progress with 30000 Right. Well, is that thirty thousand dollars appropriated, or thirty thousand that's going to come over from the operating budget? The appropriated. We need to cut fifty. We need to. We need to cut fifty thousand dollars of appropriated from. If if we restore the playground, we have to find fifty thousand dollars elsewhere in appropriated CIP. So does it make more sense if we just vote on the way this is here, and then if it fails, then we would have to talk about how to change it. I actually think that the action item that you guys are going to be voting on just specifies the amount of funding that's left in the capital budget a reduction um, in facilities. So if you said to me that $50,000 is coming out of this line versus that line, um, I don't think you need to vote specifically on that. Well, I mean, you can still vote, but the what you're agreeing to as your budget is gonna be just in the bigger chunk of facilities. I thought we had to, Kate, because of how little money is left in that. Um, I didn't think we could move that much around, but if we can from the line items, then great. Um, you need to designate it. Okay. Here's your action tonight, but the vote is more of a clump. It's more of a, you know, here's everything that's in facilities. But you okay. have to agree that that's where you want that facilities money to be spent. So then we can do a line item budget that we put out there. Okay. Sarah, is there any way you can explain, this is going backwards a little bit, but I thought that town council took out the $150,000 for the middle school tech refresh and then an additional $50,000 randomly. And so, and to me that adds up to like $200,000. Can you explain how the difference between our request and what they gave us turned out to be 400,000 or 4069? Uh, Kate can probably explain it better. For Kate, that's fine. I just, yeah. So the council in uh, the town council finance committee, the original recommendation, um, they had a recommendation that we reduce our capital budget by 81.9. I believe it was 82.9 and they landed with 81.9. They never included the $275,000 in their recommendations because they went off of our first reading and oh. said, oh, that wasn't in there. So their, uh -huh. their starting point was already well below. And then they actually ended up only taking, only taking out 50,000 more um, for that was linked in some way to the tech refresh. So okay, that, I understand it now. Yeah, and that's why mm -hmm. I think Paul was the one who was saying last night, well, if you take out the 275,000, then it's really not that much money because well, they never they never accounted for it in the first place. They, they had a different- It is a lot of money, but okay. ADA playground. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, given what we had for information, I'm withdrawing the motion. Nick has his hand up, Leanne. I don't know if you can see him. Oh, no. He didn't have it. Okay, Nick. No, not his blue hand, no, his regular hand. Ah, uh, no, I couldn't see him based on the way the screen is. Sorry. <laughs> Actual hand. Leanne, you're withdrawing your motion. Are we looking for a different one? Because I, I was going to try and swing one, but if, I don't know. What do you think? Um, if Based on what Kate said, if we do not need to make that motion and it's a matter of a line item adjustment at a different point, but I think it didn't feel as though we had appetite for this. But I, I think the discussion is heading us in a specific direction, right? I, I would agree. I don't, think there, I don't think, I don't want to mislead you. I don't think there would be any flaw in your taking a vote to get the, the temperature of the board 
on which of these items you want to reduce and which you want to retain. And um, that gives me direction. And then the ultimate um, budget amendment motion that you do later is more global. Okay. That's why I was just wondering, should we, we have make all the motion information to... we need? Sarah? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm on delay. I was just saying, should we make a, can you make a motion to pass it as it's printed here, like the way Kate reduced it? And then, yeah, sure. so, right, and then it could either yes. fail and then we could redistribute or it could be amended. Yeah. So actually, sure. you know what, I'll Sarah, now that uh, I'm, I'm talking over you again, I'm sorry. And now that I look at the okay. at the way I wrote the motion, it does say for grounds and site maintenance. So we could amend the that motion. Um, it, at it the is, time when we read it. It is, it is okay. specific on the vote now that I'm looking at it, at the actual language of it. So we, you, there could be a motion on the floor and then amendment to say, instead of 50,000 for grounds and site maintenance, we want it to be 50,000 for something else, a reduction. So that's kind of what I was gonna do in one fall swoop, but we can do it in two steps if that makes more sense. Are there other things that need to be discussed before you go to that motion, to the, to the passing of the, of the um, amendments? For CIP, you mean? Well, it's there are two motions. For, one's for, for everything, and one's for CIP. I don't have any. I don't have any other questions. Okay, I think we can go to the amendments. I'm just trying to pull it up because I forgot that I had to read it. Do you want me to put things on the screen again here? No, I'll pull it up right now. Okay. Oops. Uh, sorry, Kate. Yeah, can, do you mind pulling it up? It's not. It's coming all jarbled on my phone. Wow, I you can't see me, and now I'm on mute, and I don't know what I'm doing. All right, I'm I'm with you guys. Hang on a sec. All right, I think we're here. All right, awesome. Uh, all right, so the first action, uh, move approval to amend the FY21 school operating budget expenditures approved at the school board's second reading on June 16th as follows. Adjust the general fund operating expenditures in the following budget categories. Reduction of $150,027 to regular instruction. Reduction of $41,518 to special education. Reduction of $43,553 to student staff and support. Increase of $1,250 to system administration. Reduction of $2,882 to transportation and an increase of $6,550 to facilities and maintenance. Um, these create a total reduction of $242,180 to general fund operating expenditures, making our gross or general fund gross budget $53,311,243. Um, and the general fund net budget $48,195,356 with no changes to adult ed or school nutrition. I may have missed her, but just to, to for clarification, the special ed went over forty three thousand five eighteen. Forty three thousand five hundred. Uh, where special education? Yeah. Forty three thousand five hundred eighteen. Yeah. Sorry, did I say that wrong? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I don't know. Either you said it wrong or I said it wrong. So, and just for clarification, when you're when you're tying this out to the document we've been looking at, the process document with the blue stuff on it, those numbers are a combination of the adjustments to the insurance premiums and um, the sort of generic instruct uh, reductions to the large categories. Is there a second? Second. second. Technically, I would say there should be discussion, but um, I think we've talked a lot about where things are. So if we wanted to have any further discussion, I'd ask that we limit um, the conversation slightly. Okay. Hillary? I'll be quick. Um... I don't want to reduce our budget. I don't think it's in the best interest of our students or our community or our staff or really anybody. But um, I know that it, that we have to make adjustments based on what happened last night. Um, I just want to make it really clear that that uh, it's not really by choice. Alicia? Two people that can't help themselves. Um, is this the time where we're going to be discussing our, our, our overall position about the budget in terms of our support of it or not? Or uh, no, I, I would suggest I we do that after. Agreed. Okay. Get through this. Yeah. I think we're ready for the vote, Diane. Very good. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. King? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Apparently my dog wants to vote too. <laughs> Mrs. Yes. Seiler? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Sorry. Your dog's upset that we have to do this, Diane. <laughs> okay. All right, Kate, do you want to roll down? All right, uh, move approval to amend the FY21 school capital budget approved at the school board's second reading on June 16, 2020 as follows. Reduce the technology CIP expenditures by $50,000. Reduce facilities CIP expenditures by $356,900, uh, including $275,000 for long range planning, $50,000 for grounds and site maintenance, and $31,900 for building envelope work. Uh, the amended CIP expenditures budget total, budget total category, by category are $249,070 for technology. $1,309,142 for facilities and maintenance and $255,000 for transportation, uh, which brings our amended school capital budget to $1,813,212 and the amended portion of the school CIP budget to be funded through tax revenue will be $419,015. So moved. Second. Alicia? You're on mute. You're still on mute. Sorry. I, I'll be voting in support of the motion with the understanding that um, there will be a committee formed uh, to explore the global um, solution for ADA com um, compliance or, or ADA um, beneficial to, uh, that meets what we expect for standards for students who need to um, accessibility in the playgrounds um, and at, as, a, as a cause of um, removing the 50,000. Nick? Oh, uh, wait. Am 
I muted? I'm not muted. No, oh, well. you're not you muted. Okay. Um, is this where I can make an amendment? Okay. It is. So I would like to amend the motion on the floor to augment the facility CIP expenditures, keeping the total amount at $356,900, but increasing the reduction to long range planning to $305,000 while reducing the reduction to grounds and site maintenance to $20,000. This would leave $30,000 in grounds and site maintenance to do the, man the minimum amount necessary to allow access at the Wentworth playground. Second. Any additional discussion? Now I'm going to ask yeah, a uh, procedural uh, question. Do we vote on the amendment or do we vote on the first motion first? You have to vote on the amendment. Yeah, vote on the amendment first. If that passes, then you return to the main motion. If it passes or fails, you return to the main motion. Okay, thank you. Sarah? Yeah. I I am going to support the capital budget as presented, and I'm not going to support this amendment, but that I, I take the same stance that Alicia, Alicia is taking that I want to see this go back to the Long Range Planning Committee, and I'm also doing that based off the fact that um, Kate and Todd and Allison have all said that they can, you know, make some progress this year by taking some, moving some things around the operating budget, so um, I don't. I hate to have to ask them to do that, but um, I do think it's important that we retain $100,000 for the long range planning work. Thank you. Nick, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment? Uh, no, I keep forgetting to put it down. Okay. My bad. Nope. Just want to make sure I'm not slicing anybody out. Diane, I think we're ready to vote. Very good. Ms. Durgan? So, sorry, just to be clear, we're voting on the amendment. Correct. No. Mrs. Skiptos? No. Dr. Gill? Yes. Azalonis? No. Ms. Layton? No. Mrs. Scyther? No. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? No. Motion fails. All right, returning back to the main motion. I believe we're ready to vote on that as well. Ms. Durgan? Yes. Mrs. Skiptos? Yes. Dr. Gill? No. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? No. Mr. Bennett? Yes. The motion passes six to two. Thank you. All right. Thanks, um, Scott. Yeah, thank you. I know this was, um, it was a lot of work to get here. This doesn't feel good in any way, shape or form. Um, I think now is when we would um, offer our comments. I very rarely do this, but I'd love to start off because if I don't, I'm never going to get through what I have to say tonight. Um, <clears throat> it is in the time of crisis when you see people for who they truly are. Some people come be become more introspective, some focus their energies on helping others, and then some use that moment for their own personal gains or further a personal agenda. I wanted to believe the pandemic would bring Scarborough together as we work to reopen our schools. However, last night I saw a divide that has never been wider and has the potential to never be bridged if we continue to use words like anger, disappointment, spite, and vindictiveness as ways to describe our actions. There were numerous pleas, facts, statistics, and warnings by our constituents supporting the needs of our schools, which were shared with the closed ears of our town council. For those who spoke or have written, thank you. I am grateful for your ongoing support. Even when you may not always agree with the decisions we make as a board, we can find a mutual cause to rally around in our schools. I'm asking you now to endorse this budget for the sake of our students. This is not the budget we requested. It is certainly not the budget we needed, but it is the budget we now have after the council took what they wanted. I know we have the option to fight, which could then risk our losing even more. And frankly, this council would not feel guilty in doing so. 
but that will not bring our town together and it will only serve to create more animosity between the two sides of this discussion. It is our responsibility to model the behavior we want to see in the world and to show our children how to become even better citizens. This is our opportunity to do the right thing and be the adults that they need. Please rally together behind this budget and let's vote yes, so we can focus on what is truly in our students' best interest, being prepared for school in the fall. Nick? First, I'll say that was beautiful. Very well said. Um, the only thing, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add except to say that, I mean, we've heard it said in our meetings, we've heard it said in town council meetings, and, and even, as, even last night, I believe it was Councilor Katarina who said, nobody's thrilled with this budget, and certainly the signs around town are telling us all that, that we've got people that, that want to see it go lower. We have folks that have voiced very loudly last night that they want to see it higher, and I agree with you, Leanne. I think at this point, it's imperative that we all get behind and support this budget so that even though it's not ideal, we can have a budget and have something that's in ink because right now there's very little else in our world, the world that's in ink. I mean, coronavirus is changing by the day. We don't exactly know what the fall is going to look like, but at least if we can get a budget through our community and find some pot of money that we know is there, uh, we can start to make real plans and real progress and move toward uh, welcoming our students back in the fall. So I also support this budget. It is not ideal, um, but my worry is that without its support, if it were to fail, it would go even lower. And that's something that I just don't think we can see and it's something that I can't support. So I will be behind this budget, arguing and pleading folks to, to vote yes when they go to the polls or mail it in. So we can always get it. Kristen? Yep, I'm gonna read this too because this is gonna be hard to get through. Um, I can't say enough how disappointing the town council's actions were last night. It was really tough to watch how little they cared about the thoughtful comments offered by members of our community. Their minds were made up long before that meeting began and no weight was given whatsoever to the many emails they have received and public comments that were offered to them. While there have been other shocking behaviors the last couple of weeks, like a counselor lying in a public meeting to make the school board look bad, last night really drove home the fact this council is not going to listen to any arguments in support of appropriate funding for schools. I have so little faith that all but one member of the town council will do right by our schools that I will encourage a yes vote for this budget. Not because it's the budget that meets all of the needs for our students and staff, but because this is the most likely the best we're going to get. I fear for the cuts that will be made to our budget if the referendum fails, as this town council will view any failed referendum as a reason to cut more. They appear unwilling to acknowledge the possibility that many believe the budget is too low. And to be clear, this budget is too low. There are now too many unmet needs and too many cuts that will set our district in the wrong direction. This budget process began with both sides working very hard to find common ground in order to avoid a long contentious process. But somewhere along the way, the way, there was a breakdown in those efforts. And rather than trying to repair that breakdown, the town council chose instead to punish our schools with additional budget cuts. In the future, I will hope that the council will solve their differences with their words, not the town's wallet. While I don't necessarily believe in telling anyone how to vote, I will ask anyone who sees the same path forward to help get this done. Let's fight our hardest to get this budget passed and move on for the sake of teachers and students. We have many great challenges ahead that require the energy and attention of the administrators and staff. It's time to spend the energy where we can make a difference. Thank you. Alicia? I, I'm gonna try not to focus on my disappointment about what's happened and um, about where we are in the budget. Uh, this is our reality today and we're left with two choices, either to endorse the budget or not. I think that um, the part of me that wants to advocate for the students want, wants to say, no, we're not gonna endorse the budget. I think that that's a slippery slope. Um, I'm concerned that the message may be received as, the town believes that the budget is too high and there will be further reductions. For that reason, I will be supporting the budget. And um, I'd like to say on the positive side, we've seen our school staff come together and work hard to do what's 
best for our schools. And they've made many difficult decisions and put the students first. We've seen parents um, advocate for their students and we've seen parts of our community come together. And I think that that's, those are some of the um, positive stories that we can rely on to get us through this. And I'm going to hope that that positive trend continues and that we can really rally support um, to pass the budget so that we don't have further reductions to our students and um, get where we really need to be. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I have a lot of the same feelings um, that everyone else has shared. I've gone from being like angry to really just sad uh, the state that we're in right now to just trying to take the emotion out of it and be pragmatic, which is why I do not support this budget, but I will endorse a yes vote um, because like everyone else has said, the town council with the exception of one to sometimes maybe two counselors have shown us their true colors and uh, they under no uncertain terms have told us that if this comes back as a no, the only way this budget is going is down. Um, and I do not want to put our staff through any more of this process that they have to go through, um, that they've had to go through to date. Um, I also think that the counselors owe our administration an apology. Um, we've been told numerous times that we haven't done enough, that we haven't done our job, that we haven't moved the needle, that we're sneaky, that we're playing games, uh, and we're not. And so because they won't do it, I just want to just echo what Alicia said and just thank Sandy, Diane, Kate, the rest of the leadership team. The hours that you guys have put into this are recognized and appreciated by us. Um, we know this, these are incredibly difficult decisions. You're not, there's no good decision. There's bad and worse. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for your efforts and your hard work. And hopefully this passes and we can move forward and you guys can stop talking about budgets um, and start talking about how we get back to school safely. So thank you. Hillary? Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything everyone said, and I certainly am not going to be able to put it as eloquently as Kristen or Leanne did. Um, but I think it's, it's really unfortunate that um, we have a town council who either can't or won't accept that the board administration and staff are the experts on the schools and that they know what is needed. Um, and um, and we put forth what was needed and it wasn't accepted. Um, and and I, I, that hurts. Um, and it's only, it's, it hurts our students and it hurts our staff. And ultimately anything that hurts them hurts our entire community. Um, I'm, I'm concerned uh, because I think if we, if, if we advocated a no vote, even if every single person who voted no wrote to the town council and, and told them that it was because it was too low and asked them to increase the budget, I have absolutely no confidence that that would happen. Um, as I have heard it, they almost, every speaker I've heard in the past month has asked um, for adequate school funding. And as I've heard it, um, the majority of the emails they've gotten have asked for school funding as well. And, and that wasn't heard. So again, I have no confidence that it would be heard after a vote without a Goldilocks question. So um, as hard as it is for me, I will advocate for a yes vote, even though I agree with Sarah that this isn't an adequate budget. I don't want it to go lower. April? Um, I also wrote mine down. So if I'm looking down, I apologize. This budget process has been challenging, frustrating, exhausting, and at times demoralizing. 
And thanks to COVID, I have had the pleasure of attempting to do all of this work from a folding table in my bedroom. As someone who ran to make a difference in the budget battle, I'm afraid that I have failed many of you this year. For what it's worth, I have been told by people on both sides of the budget spectrum that I am not doing my job. So just when you thought there was no common ground left in Scarborough. And all the while, while I was not advocating enough, not pushing back enough, not standing my ground enough, I took comfort in knowing that I did this difficult job with integrity and compassion. The two things that I feel this budget needed the most. This budget is by no means robust, and I am sad to report that it does not include many new or exciting investments, but I am asking the voters to say yes anyway. This budget is by no means completely bare bones. It includes funding for activities and student extracurriculars and other things that some voters may consider extras. I am asking the voters to say yes anyway. The budget will retain most, but not all of our current staff. And in a time of uncertainty, this was of high priority. The budget maintains our program, but delays most of our new investments and curriculum. It is a relief package for those in need and the compromise from those that are willing to pay more. I'm asking the voters to say yes. This budget funds our teacher salaries, but also asks them to shoulder many of the reductions in order to insulate our students and continue to provide them with a quality education. Lastly, I would like to thank our Leadership Council for working so damn hard. Thank you to our teachers for their input and their guidance. Thank you to Sarah for keeping us on the rail. And thank you to Alicia for knocking us off sometimes. Thank you to my husband for making breakfast for dinner 10 times <laughs> throughout this entire process. Thank you to the voters of Scarborough who care so much about our community. I am asking you to say yes. Thank you, April. Hmm. Okay. And with that, um, there's a motion to a next motion be to a motion to adjourn. Um, just as a reminder, our next meeting will be um, July 16th. If there is any goodness in the world, it will be after a yes vote on the 14th. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Ms. Durgan. Yes. Mrs. Giftos. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cazalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Mr. Bennett? Yes. And vote yes to support school. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Max. Have Thank a great you. night, everybody. Good night, Charlie. <laughs>